Welcome into our debut episode of the Let's Be Frank video podcast. I am joined by Hall of Fame head coach Frank Monica. Tonight, we'll be discussing high school football coaching carousel, the LHSAA upcoming vote, and what you need to know. We'll have special guest former NFL quarterback Jake DeLome and discuss travel ball and the impact it has on the landscape of sports as we know it. But before that, Coach, again, um, our first show what made you want to cross the aisle from coming on the field to doing podcasting and broadcasting? Well, first of all, Jason, thank you so much for doing this and being the host of this show. Uh, let me explain one thing. For, let me give a little background to all the people out there that are listening to me that have nothing, really nothing to do to listen <laughs> to me. But first of all, I've been coaching for 51 years, uh, four different high schools, uh, 12 years at, at Tulane University. Uh, married my wife, Nancy. We had four kids, uh, all boys except two. You know, the, and, and just a legacy in my family of, of athletic people. And, uh, you know, the, um, uh, two, all of them played sports. All, some of them played three sports. Some of them played two sports. And, uh, you know, they went on to coaching. Uh, Ty is a, is, is a coach, and uh, he's got skins on the wall. Nicholas became a coach also. Uh, Wayne Stein is my nephew, just like a son. But they all were very, very close growing up. And all of them have skins on the wall. They all have three or four championships as an assistant coach or, or head coach in, in various sports. And, you know, I try to talk them out of playing, uh, uh, being coaches. And I said, wait a minute now. You, you, you really want to do this? Long hours, low pay, uh, microwave dinners and uh, cheeseburgers and, and uh, you know, and, and, and really being an absentee father. Uh, you're not, you're not going to see your kids very, very much, but they all went into coaching and uh, against my wishes, and, and um, they've all been very, very successful, and I hope there's, there's more to come. And, uh, you know, the, when you look around, the, uh, but Confucius used to always say, and, and I live by the same standard, you know, f- find something that you like to do, and you will work a day in your life. And that's what they've done. They've all decided to go into coaching. And from there, you know, I decided that I wanted to keep my – my hand into athletics a little bit, Jason. That's why I, d- I chose to do this and maybe touch on some subjects that might enlighten some people or turn off some people, whatever it might be. But uh, I, I enjoy this. And I enjoy sh- talking sports. And it, it keeps me active and keeps me you know, involved with the, the football end of it and the baseball end of it. And as most people know, my real background was baseball. I thought I was going to be a, a Derek Jeter until the scout to him. I was too short. But now here I am as a coach and now being a, doing a podcast. And, you know, it's been um, a crazy experience. Um, for those who don't know, I'm Jason Duway. I'm the infomercial to your television experience. I'm not the person you're here to see. Of course, you're here to see Coach Frank Monica, but I'm very honored to be a part of this broadcast. Uh, I've been broadcasting since my freshman, sophomore year in college. I've gotten many opportunities over the years, especially working with Varsity Sports now to um, broadcast games. And, again, I've known Coach Monica. I played for him in 2006 through 2010 i ran balls for him on the sideline for football for three years prior to that even the times when i brought in the wrong football and they missed field goals that was probably my fault it wasn't the kicker's fault um but i've known coach even longer than that he would run baseball camps at st charles and i remember one time i was bringing home coach would give give this award you know one of his big things was be the hammer not the nail and he had this big old mallet coach I don't know if you remember this big old mallet I'm struggling to carry to the car my mom is looking at me like where are you bringing this and I'm like coach gave me this award and I'm carrying this big old mallet and you know I have so many great memories with you and um again I appreciate you of course allowing me to host but again of course my amazing wife Mary for allowing me to be here because um Probably would be easier for me to be with my son as well. And, of course, my incredible son, Jude, who is a year and a half. And, again, uh, as you know, Coach, fatherhood's a completely different um, ball game per se. Uh, so it's been great being spending all this time with you, Coach. I said, I don't know if I've ever talked this much with you, football life. And it's been just awesome to be working this closely with you. Yo, that, thank you so much, Jace. You know, uh, I think my wife was the one that got me involved in, in the high school after I left college and and she said, you need to see Ty and Nicholas, Katie and Gene and, and, and Wayne and your, all your nephews play ball. And, and the, thank you for saying those nice things. And it's just like I wrote it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Right. And so, uh, Coach, um, we're going to go ahead and start out with some prep talk. But before we do, we want to go ahead and thank our sponsors from Accardo and DoFriend Law Firm for sponsoring this show and, of course, being a part of our broadcast. Coach? Prep, prep talk, uh, a lot going on in the world of prep football. And, of course, you can draw from your 50-plus years of experience 
in coaching to discuss some of these topics. New kids on the block, some new fresh faces at some local programs for high school football. We've discussed a few of them uh, leading up to the show. Who are the ones that you really are keeping your eye on and that intrigue you for this upcoming football season? Well, first of all, the, one of the new guys, uh, Coach Hank Tierney, you know, he's, he's destined to be a Hall of Fame guy. He just left Ponchatoula, went to Shaw High School, and they're moving down in, in the 4A. So you can look for them. They have a lot of success. And, uh, in fact, St. Charles Catholic opens with them on Friday. Uh, but it, it's, it's going to be a good game to watch. Uh, St. James has a new coach by Levante Davis, and uh, they have a really, really good team. Uh, you can expect them to, to do extremely, extremely well. Uh, coach Valdez left to go, go to be assistant coach at Grambling. And then, you know, at Riverside, you have a guy who used to be on my staff, Lee Roussel, who, who was formerly at, at Nickel State for the last seven years, and he would do a fine job there. He's got a big old running back. So there's some guys to watch. Uh, coach Guy LeComp went to Franklinton. Uh, you, you, the, uh, Brent Lind Indes, another friend of mine, former roommate at the Manning Camp. He's at Lakeshore. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of guys, a, a bunch of rounds around and some teams to watch. I mean, the, the River Paris themselves could come out of here with maybe four guys that could end up in, in the Superdome. Um, you know, and, and, and naturally, the Catholic League, the Catholic League is going to be brutal. I mean, you look at the Catholic League, uh, Shaw leaves and drops down to 4A, but they replace them with Carr High School. I mean, at the end of that, that 10 game schedule, uh, they won't need a team bus. They're going to need a Volkswagen to get everybody back. You know, and then you look along the river. I mean, you got St. Charles, who's the defending state champion. Uh, you can see you can see that a lot, a lot of good football teams in the area. And uh, not to mention not to mention the, some of the public schools and and all the other things that that, that uh, they have new coaches and new schools that have cropped up also around the New Orleans area. Yeah, and you mentioned the Catholic League already a brutal league. Let's go ahead and add part of that mix and see how that plays out. I mean. Those teams are going to have a brutal 10-game stretch, regardless of who you put in your non-district play. When you have to add Carr, who has been just an absolute powerhouse in Louisiana football to that mix, that makes your schedule that much more tougher, and you got to, there's no off week in that week. No, no question. I mean, that's, that's a tremendous league. And, and you know, the, right now, the, the district deal is, is not as important. The power ranking is the most important thing. And that's why a lot of coaches have opted to play a real, real a play up basically to, to increase their power ranking. Now some people don't don't care about that. They just want a W by their name. But the power ranking is everything. So you might see teams that have three and four losses, but they played a, a brutal schedule. And there's a lot to be said for that because that's what fans want to see. They want to see good ball games. They don't want to see blowouts and stuff like that. Uh, but but you look in the Baton Rouge area. There's there's a lot of good schools out there. You have to mention University High. Dunham is up and coming school. Uh, being a lookout for. For, for Woodlawn, uh, Catholic, Catholic High of Baton Rouge always loaded with a number of prospects, pros, uh, prospects every year. So you can expect them to be very, very competitive again and be in the show at the end. Those teams that play, as you mentioned, those teams that play out in Baton Rouge, they also have a really rough district uh, to go through. And you can make the argument that either the Catholic League or 5A ball out in Baton Rouge, really two of the toughest divisions you're going to have to play in and if you make it out unscathed then you must have a really good football team that's kind of like coming out of the sec unbeaten there's other teams on the schedule that you're going to need to play but realistically you're probably not getting beaten by one of those teams yeah yeah let me say this jason there are a lot a lot of good football along i-10 all the way to lake charles lake charles the pocket of lafayette and the crawley area a lot of good football schools and now not to mention that what's happening to monroe and shreveport those guys are factors also but when you look at it, I don't know if people realize this, there are only 12 5A schools north of I-10. So most of your population is along I-10. But there are a lot of good schools up there. So you have to be aware, especially some of these country schools and uh, that, that, that do a great job, and that's the only game in town. So that's a, that means an awful lot uh, for the community and everybody else. And, and uh, the, the way this playoff structure is, is fixed right now, all this could, could change within the next couple of weeks. And as you mentioned, we'll go ahead and change gears and talk about this major topic that's developing that people are aware of but are not really, I don't think, fully understanding the gravity of it. You've had to explain it a few times, Coach, the LHSAA meetings and the impact that it's going to have on the select and non-select, not only teams, but their brackets, the way the playoffs will work. Can you describe, first of all, what is a select and a non-select school for those who have not been fully aware of what classifies that? Well, let me, let me say this. Next week, Jason, the executive committee is 30-member executive committee made up basically of principals will meet 
and decide on what, what exactly the true definition of select, non-select was. And what they're saying right now is that if you have 25% of your student body outside your attendance zone, you would be considered a select school. Now, basically, that would subdivide the state into about 45% of, of select and 55% non-select. Or another way, like my good friend Dwayne Jenkins rephrased it as traditional school and non-traditional schools. Traditional schools like the community schools where kids come from your, your, your own attendance zone, not from math and science schools or charter schools or things like that, or uh, people crossing boundary lines. Now, that's, that's the definition there. But... When they vote on this thing, and the word is that would probably happen, is that they will go to eight maybe possible championships, four select, four non-select, all to be played in the Superdome, and if, and with a 24-team bracket. Now, if this thing is not passed like that, what will take place is that they revert back to the old way, the nine championships or something like that. But the word is that they probably will, will do this, and it really, really sounds like a, a pretty good deal to me in, uh, in, in terms of, of uh, equal competition. The LHSA got a little concerned about a lot of these blowout games because when you took the select out of the playoffs of the, of the, private, of the public schools, what happened, you weren't playing one versus 32 anymore, which happened years ago before the split. Where there were some teams that were ranked 32nd and actually beat the number one seed. Well, when you take the select schools out of there, that, that 32nd team now is probably like a 45. So that, you don't see those upsets anymore. And some people opted not even to play or, or go into it. So there would be some appeals. Now, it's another thing on the agenda. Uh, Arlene's Parish, Jefferson Parish, they, they, they were considered to be select. Now, whether those schools appeal that or not, we don't know. Lafayette Parish is another one, uh, Sabine Parish. So they're, they're, they will have to say uh, exactly why they, they, they belong in a certain area, whether they select or non-select. So the executive committee has a lot to, to talk about, plus the Superdome and exactly who plays when and the Superdome and the, and the schedule, if this, if this all comes about. So what can change there is that some coaches would be a little bit upset if they did. But I, I kind of like the idea because uh, every game will be an important game and, uh, and there won't be as many blowouts. And, and, and I like the idea because, you know, but what, what some people are saying uh, about this is that, wait a minute, had I known this, I would have scheduled differently. So I guess the drawback is that decision will not be made until after they played a couple games here on the regular, ski, uh, regular season schedule. So, but the, there, there would be benefits. Every game's important. Uh, you have to make, I think you, every, uh, you have to get yourself ready. There won't, there, there won't be the buys in there. And I really think that it's, it could be good for the state and, and for football and, and high school in general. You know, and that's what people want to see. Nobody wants to see a, a blowout game. As you mentioned, the number of forfeits um, have been jarring. To when you look at the brackets that have been out the past few years, the teams that just say, look, I'm not going to go risk my players getting hurt. It makes no sense for me to go play. And you don't want to see forfeits, especially in the playoffs. You know, it's supposed to be high-level intensity football. Coach, the discussion for the four championships on both sides of the bracket, is this the only solution that you think would work? Or is there any other possible solution that you could see possibly being on the table that would work? Or just, in your opinion, that would work better? I, I, think, I think right now, I think it's, it's, it's got a very good chance of, of, uh, of being successful and a very good chance of passing, uh, unless there are a lot of these appeals. Now, I don't know who's appealing. We don't know that at this time. Uh, we understand that won't be many appeals, but there will be some people that will say, wait a minute now, I need to stay where I am. Um, but on, on the flip side of it, uh, there, I think that what the, what the LHSA also saw, when the select schools played their own venue, they made a lot of money. Now, there was a lot of money there, you know, because once you play in the Superdome, everything is prorated. You know ahead of time, 5A is going to get 11500 11, and then next is going to get 10500 Well, some of these schools went home and made like $50,000 a paycheck for a championship game. And that's, a, that, that's a, enough to float your ath athletic department for the entire year. So that is something that comes about. And I really, I really think, though, though, everybody would like to see the championships in the Superdome, you know, because the, 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 Coach at the beginning of the year, that's part of their motivation in the, in the locker room. They make signs, they make T-shirts uh, with the Superdome in mind and saying that that's the, that's the destination, that's the journey that you want to get to. So I think that's great, and it's a great venue for kids. Um, e even though that the, the select side broke away for a little bit, uh, there are a lot of factors concerning that. But the, the bottom line is that I can see this being very successful. The alternative thing is to go back like it was. And, and let's hope that doesn't happen. Now, is there a plan 
Uh, Jason, a lot of people are saying, well, is this a, a move to actually move everybody back together again? I don't know if that's to be a fact, but uh, we certainly, I think a lot of people, a lot of uh, people like to see that, like to see a 15-game championship, so to speak, because there's a lot of revenue that's, that's not made by the select schools if you don't play 15 games. And, um, but yet on, on, the, on the other side of the spectrum, um, there might be a lot of schools that say, hey, wait a minute, let's, stick, let's keep this like it is. I think the executive committee holds the trump card. And listen, Mr. Bonine has a tough job. He inherited the, the, the split. He inherited the select, non-select thing. So when he came in here, you knew that was, going to be a, a, that was going to be the number one thing that he was trying to do, I think, at one particular time, is try to appease both sides. And Coach, to his credit, he has tried. We've seen many times where he's made the attempt to mend fences and, and allow both sides to come together. Ultimately, it hasn't happened. One thing that you can speak to is when you when something doesn't impact you in what you would deem in a negative way, people are kind of ambivalent. It doesn't really matter to them. It's not impactful. With these new schools being considered select, and if their appeals don't go their way, can you envision in the near future where they would mend fences and be one championship game for each bracket and not a select and non-select? You got to remember now, Jason, whatever is passed, it's only, it's only for one year uh, until they meet in January again. And January is the big convention, and that's where all the agenda items, the agenda items must be turned in by November. And so if you have some type of item that you want to put on the agenda, it has to be written up and, and, and brought to the, the floor. It has to be second, and then the membership has to vote on that. Now, in, in the past, because of COVID, uh, th some of this was done virtually and the whole deal. But now, remember, whatever takes place now is just for this year. So anything can change when January comes around, and next year the football season can look totally, totally different in terms of – the numbers and, and where they are as far as district. The other thing is that I did not mention is that uh, with the with the 24 teams, some schools, some schools will move up in class and not to where they are now. Uh, they, they could be if they're a 2A school now, they could be up in another division uh, with this select thing. So some of the people that thought that they were in a certain group could be in another group now to balance it off. So that's a, that's a thing that, that uh, people need to consider also. Coach, one thing, can you clarify for those at home? We've again, we've talked about this, but I'm not sure if we hit on it directly. We're still not 100% sure how these championships and how these playoffs are going to be situated until this vote, which is crazy to think about, but that's the world we're living in right now in Louisiana football. We don't know how the playoffs are going to set up. So you have these coaches who are not yet aware how their playoffs would be structured and these players who have no idea. So can you speak to that real quick? Well, yes, I mean, you know, the bottom line is that I think a lot of coaches were a little upset that this came up all, all of a sudden. But I think a lot of them are in agreement with it. And, it, you know, if you took a poll of the coaches, they said, hey, this, this makes sense. And I guess if you, were, if you were thrown in a select and you didn't have any idea about that, you might not be too fond of, of the idea. But I, w I would think that uh, uh, with the executive committee, you never know how this would come out and who's going to make a stand. And, and the, uh, Mr. Bonine is the leader of that. And, and, um, and his staff, I'm sure they do a lot of research on, on that part to say exactly, come up with facts and figures. Uh, but again, uh, the, the, the upsetting thing about the coaches is their standpoint, wait a minute, I'm playing a couple of ball games here and I still don't know what the playoff situation would be like. Had I known this, I'd have scheduled somebody else here. You know, because if you're playing a real, real tough pre-district schedule, and as I said before, the district championship doesn't mean very much uh, anymore. You know, you play a district because it gives you a schedule. That's basically what it is. But a lot of the districts are, are, are not real strong districts, but, and, and they're local. They look so you don't have to travel as far. I mean, that's fine. And they give, it gives you games. That's why some people argue about it. But there's also been talk in the past by the LHSA about doing away with districts completely. And in, in, in terms of, there were a lot of things that would, that would be brought up. And, and you know, the, the Football Coach Association, I, I might add this, uh, many, many of the rules in, in the handbook uh, are geared towards football. And I mean, naturally, we have a lot of a lot of sports now in Louisiana, and, and a lot of these uh, new principals are in Louisiana, and and uh, it's hard for a principal to keep up with everything. I, for one, would love to see the day when when uh, AD himself can be the the, the vote uh, the vote uh, from that each school. What does it matter who votes for that school? Each school should get one 
but I like to see the day where that AD, that, oh, those principals trust their ADs. I mean, they know what's going on. The principal has too many other things to worry about uh, in, in the school. They have more sports now than they ever had before. When I was growing up, there was football, baseball, basketball, and track. Now you have a, a number of, you have 20-something different sports in, in LHSA that they have to monitor. So how can the principal keep up with all those things? At AD, that's his job to keep up with that and the sports seasons and eligibility and all these other things. And the principal gets the blame, but the AD must be given more and more power. He's now allowed to sit by the principal at the meetings. Uh, in, the, in the past years, they couldn't do that, but now they're allowed there. But to me, uh, it, it, it could be very, very easy to rectify it. Let the ADs handle the the, the, the voting part of it because they know more about the athletic side of it and the principals have too much when they played already. And I'll wrap things up for our prep segment. We want to go ahead and give our sponsors a shout out. Again, our sponsor, Accardo and Dufresne Law Firm. Samuel Accardo Jr. and Henri P. Dufresne, your go-to River Parish lawyers. Experience, tenacity, and results. Sammy Accardo and Henri Dufresne provide comprehensive legal services in personal injury, hurricane claims, business litigation, successions, and estate planning. Our trial experience, know-how, and commitment to protect and serve our clients is unparalleled. We provide complete real estate, title, and escrow services through our affiliate, State, Sur State Title LLC. The River Parish is our home, and serving our communities is our passion. Welcome back to the Let's Be Frank video podcast. Our guest is a former NFL quarterback who spent time in Europe, spent time with the Saints, the Panthers, the Browns, and the Texans, where he amassed nearly 21,000 yards and threw for 126 touchdowns. He competed in the 2003 Super Bowl against the New England Patriots after throwing for nearly 1,000 yards and six touchdowns in that run. None other than former Turlings Catholic and University of Louisiana quarterback Jake DeLome. Jake, thanks so much for joining us. and. Of course, you moved from calling the plays on the field in the huddle to the booth. What's that transition been like for you? It's been probably more fun than I expected. I um, Listen, I'm a football junkie. I love football. I um, My two favorite forms of football are high school football and the NFL. And I, I listen, I love college football, but I'm a huge NFL guy. I think for playing in it for 15 years, I just – a certain attraction and there's nothing like Friday night lights. There's nothing like Friday night football. And like I said, I do love college. It's just, I, um, football was my life. And so when I finished playing, I, I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do in, in life, to be quite honest, because here I am 37 years old and all I ever knew was how to play football, I guess you could say. So, um, I, I wanted to stay involved some, somehow, some way, but then I didn't want to miss kids activities on the weekends my girls were growing up at that time and it had been in the works for me possibly to go back to carolina and do the uh, color analyst for the radio broadcast team and 2019 we started that and i fell in love with it uh we had a hiatus with the COVID year but i've been doing it um since then and i'm looking forward to it it's a great deal of fun it kind of keeps me connected to the game that i love and certainly the carolina panthers that's a, a organization that that's near and dear to my heart Look. And Jake, let's thanks so much on, from our end that, uh, you know, this is our first uh, particular podcast, the first in my career. And, and to have you kick it off is just tremendous, tremendous uh, deal for, for us, all of us here. But I want to go back and Jake and tell the, the people that are listening exactly where you came from. You played at a small school at Turlins High School. And I remember going to watch you play one night against Newton High School. And you threw like five touchdown passes that night against a real good football team. They were very, very athletic. Coach Perkins was your coach back then. And I went back on the recruiting trail, and I told the offensive coordinator, you got to go see this guy play. And he said, uh, he said he, I told him he plays at a small school, but he is really competitive. I loved your moxie in the huddle, the way you handle things. And you've always been like that your whole life. You were hyper in the huddle. You can tell that you love the game, and you were competitive. And uh, then from there, you know, he went to see you, and he came back with the same story in the recruiting. He said, he said, Coach, he said, I, I really like this guy. He said, we really need to look at this guy thoroughly. And so you take it from there. From there, you went on to ULL, uh, didn't have an opportunity, but you went to ULL, and you came back and actually beat us at Tulane as, as, a, as a player. And then from there, you, uh, you know, you're always the underdog, and all of a sudden you end up uh, in a glorious, glorious career and playing in the Super Bowl. Take it from there. Tell us about your journey, Jay. Yeah, listen, I'm going to be – listen, let's be frank, right? That's the podcast <laughs> that we're on. Um, 
I came down to two schools for me when I was being recruited. Um, I got recruited and offered by everybody in the state except the LSU. I got recruited hard up until about December of that year. Um, and I got recruited by Duke and West Point and things of that nature, but I didn't want to go that far away. Um, and it came down to two places, and it was Tulane, and at the time it was southwestern Louisiana. And really and truly, it came down to two coaches in my eyes. It came down to Frank Monica and Louis Cook, um, two legends in, 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 in coaching football. Um, Louis still coaching, and Coach Monica, there's no doubt he could still coach. Um, <laughs> but I visited Tulane, and I went with every intent to commit on that December, second uh, Saturday in December, Sunday in December. It was during the high school championships, and uh, and Buddy Tevens, I give him credit. He was very honest with me. And uh, Coach Monica told my mom and dad and myself right before we met with him, he goes, hey, I'm not sure he'll offer you today. He wants to meet the other two kids he's recruiting in person, and we'll go from there. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And driving back uh, from New Orleans, I remember thinking to myself, well, if Coach Tevens needs to meet the other two before he offers me, then I'm not his guy. Because if I'm his guy, he's going to offer me. And uh, and that was hard. That was a blow to my ego because I, really and truly, I wanted to go to Tulane. I wanted to, to go there. Um, and then I, I, just, I stayed home and played for um, Nelson Stokely and Coach Louis Cook here in Lafayette. And it was probably the greatest decision I ever made. I was able to come in and play right away. Um, I'm not so sure we were overly talented at quarterback. It was a team that had some talent on it. And I was able to fit in and yeah, it was a lot of fun. We played Tulane twice in my four years. We were able to beat them both times, which was nice, in the Superdome, a place that I cherish. Um, and then we played Louisiana Tech four times, and I take great pride in saying we beat them all four years in a row. So we never we never lost to a state school. So that's yeah. And I remember that, uh, that Jake. That, you I, beat that it. I always stay with me. You beat it on the fourth down and 15. You completed the pass. You scrambled and completed the pass to beat us in the Superdome. And, then, and the, what I remember best is that at the Manning camp, Every time I run to Buddy T, not every time, but he's been to me, he said, Frank, he said to him, hey, we taken Jake DeLone, we'd still be at Tulane, wouldn't we? I said, yes, sir, we would be. <laughs> and he says that all the time because he was, he was just competitive. But, it was, you know, recruiting is, is an opinion. And, uh, but you look at people and you played at a very, very small school and you were almost not a, quite a pencil neck, but you were tall, you know, uh, a slender oh, guy. Was, yeah, but was, you could I throw. Was, uh, six foot two and I was 165 pounds of, uh, of, of, not much muscle in high school, to say the least. So I'm still the same height. I've gained about, you know, 60 pounds since then or 50 pounds since then. But, yeah, I was pretty skinny. Now, both of us are big, big racehorse fans, and you own horses right. and train horses, Jake. But to go to the Super Bowl, you were about a third of one odds if, this was, if there was a better line on that. Wasn't that at one time? Yes, sir. There's no doubt. And, um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to uh, play all four years at UL, and then the Saints signed me as a free agent. Um, I kind of hung around, just kind of, you just got to hang on in the NFL, to be quite honest. I got sent over to NFL Europe twice. I didn't play the first year. Didn't realize I was backing up a future Hall of Famer in Kurt Warner, but I kept on saying to my, when I call home and talk to my, my wife, uh, now my girlfriend at the time or my parents, and I'd say, he's pretty, da- he's pretty accurate, you know, and he's, <laughs> he's a good guy and he just, and just so happens he's Kurt Warner, but, uh, Things worked out. It, uh, it took a little while. Things worked out. Never truly got a chance with Jim Hazlitt when he was in New Orleans and uh, became a free agent, and I chose between Dallas and, um, and Carolina, and I'm glad I chose Carolina, a team ready to win, and it worked out. It was a lot of I'm fun. T- and- I'm telling you, Jake, this is a true story. I called the guy who I knew at the, the Saints office one day, and I said, listen, uh, if you give Jake DeLome a, a shot at playing quarterback, he's going to solidify that position, and you won't look back. And he said, really? I said, I'm telling you, that guy's a winner. And that's all we can say. He's a winner. He has, he has the moxie. He has the control of the huddle. The players love him because he has all the things and greetings that a good quarterback should have. And, it, and I don't, that, that opportunity finally came at Carolina. And I think no one more proud of us to be right for a change. Well, you know what? I appreciate you saying that. That means a lot. And, but, I mean, I think that's, as a quarterback, I think that's what you have to be. I mean, you have to be all in. And you, you just – I don't know. I just Drew Brees is probably a lot more maybe um, 
I don't want to use the word stoic, but Drew was almost computer-like. You know, it was like he was just so focused. And I played with a little more uh, kind of emotions on my sleeve. And, uh, and that's just the way I was. And I didn't care who got the glory. I, that, that meant nothing to me. As long as we had one more point than the other team on the scoreboard, that, that's what it was about. It was about winning. And that's what it kind of worked going in Carolina with that with, with that team and Coach Fox, our, our coach. And it just worked. So I was uh, very thankful. You know, Jake, I, I still work the man camp, and there are some, some, some great arms out there. I see some of these kids that are tall, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, they got great arms. But the difference is exactly what you just said. What do they do in that film room and how much study and how much research? You know, because you look at Drew's arm, you look at Peyton Manning's arm, and, I mean, right. it, 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 some of those arms don't even stack up. Now, Eli had a strong arm, but some of those guys in the little hot, uh, hot shots in the Manning camp, they can really throw the football. But why don't some of them make it? Now, it, it leads me to my next question. I, when you guys are elevated Baker Mayfield, he was one of my favorite guys in the Manning camp a couple of years ago because he had some of the same qualities I see in you. Well, you know, Coach, I'm excited to watch him play, and I, and I feel when I watch him, he's just – He's got that that grit. There's something about him. And, and and Sam Darnold was the quarterback last year and really a great kid and a little more physical presence uh, than Baker, bigger, probably a stronger arm, um, more sturdy, I guess you can say. But it's like that drive's not there. Now, I, I don't want to say the drive. It's just that moxie, whatever you want to call it, that it factor. It seems like Baker has it. So I'm excited this this year to watch him play. Um, and it, nothing better than he's playing because Cleveland didn't want him anymore. And that's exactly the mindset that he's going to take. So I'm looking forward to watching him play. And if we can protect him, if Christian McCaffrey can stay healthy, I think he'll have a pretty good year this year and solidify himself going forward. Jake, what do you think of the, some of the qualities that you, you should see? Because there's a lot of controversy about that. You know, it's a NFL is a, is a quarterback-driven league. Well, even colleges now, with all the spread offenses and stuff like that, at the RPO thing, the RPO game, you know, when you and I were in college, we didn't have so, so much of that. There's a lot of complaints about it from the defensive side. But what do you think some of the qualities now that people are looking for in the quarterback, especially in the NFL? Well, my, my thing is this. It, anticipation and accuracy. I think that trumps everything else. I, I truly believe that. Um, George Munoz is a good friend of mine. He's coaching at UL now. He was at LSU for like three of the last four years. And we, we're very close friends. And we were talking after Joe Burrow's junior year at LSU. George was the quarterback coach. He was an analyst, but the quarterback coach. And I asked him, I said, I asked you a question. Are y'all changing your philosophy on recruiting quarterbacks now because of Joe Burrow? And he said, why do you ask that? I said, because he's not this rocket arm, big quarterback that has all the tangibles. I said, but he's got every intangible that you want. And he's a, he, uh, he's a gritty winner. And this was before the Heisman Trophy uh, season. And he said, you know, it's funny. We brought that up in meetings and in talking. He doesn't have the strongest arm, but he anticipates. He has accuracy. The team believes in him. He's tough as nails. And that's kind of what you want. And then the rest of the story with Joe Burrow, but the same way, Peyton didn't have the strongest arm. Yes, he was 6'6", but he didn't have this rocket arm. Drew Brees, the same way. I mean, he's six foot on a good day. Russell Wilson, 5'10 and a half maybe. Um, but Joe Burrow, just watch him take the NFL by storm. And it's not like it's a rocket arm, but anticipation, accuracy, not, not afraid to hang in the pocket, take a hit, and, um, and just get your team to believe in you and believe in everything, and they're going to go out and do it on the field. Jake, you brought up a good point. One thing I always try with my players and, and as a team, I always wanted to, to have a full rush so that guy needed to hear the noise and to see how he reacted with the noise in the, around it because, you know, 7-on-7 seven seven doesn't do it justice. He needs to see the noise. He needs to realize that there's, there's a lot of uh, traffic and, and, uh, and anticipation out there, as you talked about. But I think it's, it's very, very important for the guys to be able to step up and take a hit because some of the better throws are when the guy just releases the ball, but he has to be able to stay, uh, uh, stay focused up the field all the time and maybe take that hit in the huddle, I mean, in the pocket. And unfortunately, uh, some guys don't like to do that. they like they got the happy feet and they like, to, they like to scramble. Would you elaborate a little bit on that? No, absolutely. I think the, one of the worst things in the world for a quarterback, and I, I'm guilty of it, I hated inside pressure. If there was pressure, center guard area, when you couldn't see that, that I didn't mind edge pressure because you had to step up or you could kind of chip and help. 
but I hated inside pressure. And Tom Brady is probably the greatest quarterback we have ever seen. And the two super, two out of the three Super Bowls that he lost, you know, against the, the Eagles, he threw for 500 yards. It wasn't. It was his defense's fault. But when they lost to the Giants. The front four of the Giants got pressure on Tom Brady constantly inside and just kept on after him, and you get uncomfortable. That's not a good feeling. Quarterbacks like to feel somewhat comfortable or give them a chance to kind of step up into the pocket and things like that. But, again, the noise. Seven-on-seven, seven, yeah, that's great, these seven-on-seven seven leagues. But that's not real. That, that's, exactly. that's, that's not real football. It's, you're not getting people around your legs. Nothing, it's not as clean as it's like 7 on 7 is going to be. You have to have the trash going around you at all time. Yeah. Jake, you know what? I used to go, when I had an opportunity, I would go watch the Saints and I don't watch their practices. I got a chance to go in the quarterback room, and Drew Brees was in there several times. And it was, it was unbelievable his preparation and his, his command of the playbook itself how serious he was in the playbook, and, and he actually was tougher on himself. The film would, would, uh, would actually reveal something, and Drew would say, well, what should I have done here? He was always correcting himself and being harder on himself. But as you said, did not have the strongest arm. He made a living on screens and check downs and stuff like that, but he knew where everybody was. You know, cause He made a lot of good receivers, average guys, great receivers. I agree with you 100%. And, you know, I love hearing like, oh, this is a new guru calling offensive plays. Well, no, it's not. Like Sean Payton ran the same plays, in my opinion, watching them play from 2006 through 2020 with Drew. He ran the same plays. I mean, when they get inside the red zone, they're running four verticals, and Drew's making them right. He's going to back shoulder somebody. He's going to hit somebody in the seam. If it's not there, he's going hit to the, hit the back immediately. They would just run the same plays. They'd run the half boot type of situation and have a three level combination and drew is going to make them right. And that's the thing that if you just do something well, you don't have to have all the, have the pencil last to make it work, but you have high execution. You win football games and you can play for a long period of time. And, and he did that. I mean, I, I was just amazed, you know, uh, coach on the staff said one morning at four 30, he walked in the, it walked in, he heard the, the weight room uh, was wide open and he heard the, the weights clanging in there and he went in there, it was Drew Brees working out. I mean, here's a guy that is all pro, didn't have to do that, but working out, and, 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 the, and the, it showed on the field. And, you know, he ticked some, some of those average guys. I mean, and I'll take the, Jimmy Graham. I mean, all of a sudden, Jimmy Graham, he made him a great receiver. And when he leaves and goes to another, another uh, uh, particular team in the NFL, you didn't hear much about the guy. Yeah, and that, that's what the great ones do. I mean, when Peyton Manning leaves Indy and he goes to Denver, right, it's, everybody's buttoned up. Everybody's buttoned up and they're going to do things a certain way. Tom Brady, Tampa, they, they just, they kind of just eight and eight, you know, seven and nine, whatever it may be. Tom Brady goes there. Well, they're, they're Super Bowl champions because every single day it's be at your best every single day. And it just kind of makes everybody step up their game. Uh, and players want to go play for them. They want, especially at the end of their career, hey, I made some good money. That's fine and whatnot. I want to win. I want to go where the winner's at. And that's where you see guys wanting to go to Tampa and play with Tom. That's great. Hey, tell me a little bit about your daughters. I know they, they were great volleyball players. Tell me a little bit about your family, Jake. Well, I have two daughters. I have one that's a sophomore in college, and uh, she was a high school basketball player. And I truly believe if she could have played football, she would have. She was my one that <laughs> – um, but she's the oldest, and so she grew up going into a stadium, and she understood uh, everything that uh, – w- everything that I guess that we did as a family, so to speak. And my, my next one's, um, she kind of can do whatever she wants. She likes volleyball. She's a sophomore in high school. So, uh, she was at the tail end of my career. So she doesn't remember very much at all about it, but, uh, yeah, my oldest could, um, I think if she could have suited up, she should have wanted to play. Yeah. Jake, you know, I know you're a big horse fan and, and uh, I watched the big race the other day, and I didn't win any money on it. In fact, I, I'm, I'm a, I hope I can claim some of my losses on the taxes, Jake, because I'm in a hole big time. So you need to help me. Give me a nice exacto to get me out of the hole. But how, did, how is that relative to actually coaching and, and, and training athletes? Well, listen, I'm third generation. So I was, born, I was born and raised in a barn, so to speak. I didn't grow up hunting, fishing, or golfing. Um, it's something that I love. So I went to school, I played sports and we had the horses. And so football gave me a chance to expand on it. And I love it. I'm at the barn every day that if I'm not in Carolina or traveling during the season, I'm at the barn every single day. That's my love. And the thing I love about it, it's extremely competitive. And it's, um, if you win as an owner, 
18 to 22 percent of the time you're doing pretty well you, you you're that successful in any other walk of life you're fired especially as a quarterback <laughs> you win 20 percent of your games you're fired so very competitive and the thing that i enjoy about it i'm the head coach the general manager and the owner i buy the horses i pick them out uh, and things like that. So if there's anybody to blame, you're looking at him right here. But it, it's just it's a great deal of fun. It's like kind of molding a team. And I always felt that way. The horses are like guys you played with, some that are not the most talented, but they're going to give you everything they have. They're not going to make the mistake. You're going to have the ones that are very talented, but they're kind of not totally focused. And the ultimate combination is to have the one that's totally focused and has the the great talent, and you were always searching for those. Jake, I'm, I'm amazed. Uh, you know, I went back to the barn one time at the fairgrounds. I'm amazed they treat these horses like rock stars. I mean, they work them out like 5 o'clock in the morning, and they, they cool them down, and they bathe them, and they blow dry them, and they, they feed them, and they put a little lamb or something in there with them, and then they, they feed them. I mean, I mean, it's amazing. It's like, and they, they, they know they're competing. It's a, unbelievable how they know they're competing. I mean, just like athletes. Exactly right, and that's the thing that I think horse racing gets a bad rap is that these horses are so well taken care of. I mean, look, Coach, I know what I spent taking care of mine, and uh, they get taken care of pretty darn well. So, uh, but no, I mean, you want to. To me, it's a, it's like watching. It's a, an extension of a child. I mean, certainly it's not my uh, my child. How I feel about my child, but it's not far off. It's how I feel about them, and love to watch them compete, and it helps uh, fill that competitive void. No question. Jake, we can't thank you enough for being with us. Jason, anything else for Jake that you've done? You've made our show. You really have made our show. Thank you so much for having a Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl contender like yourself and, and the whole deal. I mean, you have a lot of stories, and I hope I can see you again at the, at the Manning camp, you know, because that's been a uh, – there's some, there some great uh, young guns out there that keep coming I, back. I, I, a bunch I of them, hyper trophy winners. Right. I can't tell you how much I love it and I miss going back. And it's like this year I had a niece that was getting married. And so, well, couldn't go. I, let's just say that I need to make sure I stayed in good graces. But I couldn't wait to text Peyton and say, hey, how the quarterbacks throw? Who's the best one? Like the college kids. I love that. I love meeting those kids, watching them coach a three step drop, a five step drop. You get to see it. I, I remember telling someone five, six years ago, maybe the 20 year reunion, uh, there was 36 quarterbacks there, college quarterbacks, or 38. And they said, who's the best one? And I said, listen, the most talented one that I saw in my eyes throwing the ball was Jared Goff. I said, but this guy from Mississippi State, Dak Prescott, I said, I want to be inside the huddle with him. I said, there's something about him. He's like a magnet. You just want to be, be next to him. And it's just kind of funny when you watch how their careers have gone on. Jared can really throw it. He's pretty and things like that. But Dak, he's just, he's just got it. He's just got all those intangibles. They had some good ones this year. One guy I want you to keep an eye on, Jake, that had that. His name is Devin Leary from North Carolina State. Okay. Tremendous spin on the ball and a real, real good teacher. And he looked like one of those kind of class guys that's bound to be a success in the NFL. That's good to know. I'll definitely put that in my cap. Absolutely. Yes. All right, Jake, thank you so much for taking the time to be on our show. And Again, um, you know, we, we appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule. We know you're busy calling your games and dealing with your horses, but we appreciate you taking 20 minutes of your time to come talk with us. Absolutely. I loved it. I'll do anything for Coach Monica. I, uh, you know, he was such a, such a class man and gentleman, and it was lucky. You get recruited. They had some coaches that was always negative, negative recruiting and stuff like that, and the two schools I wanted to choose from, the two guys never recruited negative, negatively about anybody else. It was a it was a relationship. It was a conversation. I'm still friends to this day. So that's something I really appreciated, and I always kind of kept that in my mind. Thank you, well, Jake. Please tell Mom and Dad hello, and send me a nice exacto, please. Absolutely. <laughs> Will do, Coach. We want to give a, a word to our sponsors. We want to go ahead and thank LSR, Louisiana Sugar Refinery, for being a sponsor for our show. And we also want to thank Acadia Services, LLC. If you're in need of storage space at your home or business, stop by and visit the good folks at Acadia Services, LLC at 1301 West Airline Highway in Laplace. Seth Bourgeois and his employees are there on weekdays from 9 a.m. to 5 and Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Give Acadia Services a shout at 985-359-1333 for your, all your storage and U-Haul truck rental needs. 
Coach Monica is never short on opinions when it comes to the world of sports, so let's jump right into our Let's Be Frank segment where Coach has his chance to tee off on things in the world of sports that he feels in need of focusing on. So, Coach, starting off this segment, you really wanted to focus on travel sports, and you have a very passionate opinion on that. So let's dive in. What are your feelings and thoughts on travel sports and athletics? Well, first of all, Jason, let me qualify this a and from the standpoint, I, I, my whole background was actually as a college baseball player and high school baseball player. I had my own kids play travel sports. Uh, Ty and Nicholas, Katie and G, they all played some travel sports at, at one time. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that I, I, I think there's a spot in our society for travel sports. But when travel sports all of a sudden starts to take place in high school and start to pigeonhole guys, which I don't really like, all girls, I think that's, that something must be done about it. First of all, number one, uh, there are kids that are playing all year long. And, it, and if you're playing all year long, whether it's volleyball, travel soccer, travel baseball, uh, seven on seven tournaments, if you're doing that, you're probably not playing another sport. I think your high school, I think that the four years in high school or blur or five years, whatever it might be, I think it's so important to play for your high school first. And I hear so many stories out there about, about guys playing, in, uh, they, they're being promised that they'll be recruited by being in, in the select deal. You know, every baseball player, every little 10 year old thinks he's going to be Derek Jeter. And, you know, it's very, very expensive. Number one, uh, parents pay out of the wazoo uh, to be on the travel team. Uh, almost everybody gets on the travel team. I see it. Uh, you know, I see kids that they're playing 11 and 12, and they can't you can't catch a, a fly ball. You know, when I was growing up, you can you can drop a ball from the, the uh, Artemis one, and we could catch it. But nowadays, I see playing travel ball, and I see five foot five foot uh, girls, uh, and and they're playing travel volleyball, and they're not playing anything else. And I mean, there, there needs to be some regulation there, and I'm all for it. Like I said, there's a time and place for travel ball because I know it, it expands them. It allows them to travel a little bit, play against real good elite competition, that nature, but not at the expense of another sport. You know, I would love to see an example. I mean, uh, St. Charles Catholic won the state championship uh, in baseball this year. Every one of his starters played football. And what does that do? It makes them, keeps them competitive. It keeps them, makes them stronger because you're in a weight room. And I, I, I'm hearing stories now where seven-year-old, a guy told me the other day, a seven-year-old had a 55-game schedule from now until May in baseball, a seven-year-old kid. Uh, there's a guy in, in, in 707 football is getting to be big also. Uh, there's a good friend of mine. A, a player walked in his office one day, and the player said, Coach, he said, can I use the weight room? And the coach said, well, son, who are you? And the son explained. The guy said, well, I'm, I'm so-and-so. And the coach said, what school do you go to? He said, I go to this school. He said, wait a minute now. You play in a 707 travel football league, and you don't play football for me? He said, I don't understand. He said, yes, coach. He said, my coach told him I'm going to get recruited and I'm going to get more exposure that way. And but plus, I, I won't get hurt. And I said, well, you know, that's that's a poor excuse. And I mean, that's what's happening in our society now. And the worst part about this whole scenario is that the, the some of the high school coaches themselves are, are telling these own players that, wait a minute, don't play this sport. You, we're going to win a championship, something like that. Really, really galls me because I was an AD for a number of years also. I'm in a gym and I'm watching the 6'4", six, 6'5", six, basketball player that can slam dunk. And I said, I walk up to him and said, do you play any other sport? He said, no, sir. I play strictly basketball. I said, well, you know, that if you're 6'3", six, 6'4", six, I go to any gym in New Orleans in Louisiana and find one like you. But a 6'4", six, 6'5", six, guy playing football, for instance, he's a, all of a sudden he's a prospect. But, but my point being is that don't pigeonhole yourself. Play all the sports. You never know which one's going to be. I myself was a product of a football, baseball guy. Hadn't been for, for baseball. I didn't, I did not sign, but I loved my, my football when I, was, when I was in high school. And I, I see so many coaches saying, wait a minute now. And uh, I see a, there's a pool by the travel ball people that, that don't play in the rec ball. Well, why, why not? Why not play rec ball first? And, and, and after that, let the recreation center pick an all-star team, go somewhere, and let the B players continue the league. Because now what's happening, they're playing in April during school. They're playing in March and April. There's, their league is finishing in May, all in because of travel ball. So they can go play their travel ball deal. And again, I'm not against that. But there's a place for it. Don't give up on the recreation center because to me, that's where they all learn. That's where they all learn the fundamentals. So I see a lot of this going on right here. And it upsets me because uh, the LHSA just passed something. I don't know if the people are aware of this. 
At one time, you had what we call a sports season. Well, the NFL said we spent a lot of meeting time on the sports season, which meant that a team, for instance, soccer could not practice for October 1, basketball couldn't practice for a certain date, and blah, blah, blah. And it went down the line of all the sports. Well, it was a very stringent schedule, and you couldn't violate that. Well, all of a sudden, the basketball coaches came in and said, wait a minute now. We, w- we want to be able to at least have three players for one. Well, that's three-fifths of a team. Then the next year, they gave them two more weeks to practice, and then it went to four and one. So, and now, from what I understand, you can practice all year long. And, and the only safeguard is if, if the principal allows it. So what is that going to do? That's going to make that's going to make some of these coaches grab some of these guys, and they're going to pigeonhole them. They and they're going to they're going to practice soccer all year long. They're going to practice baseball all year long. If you're playing fall baseball, fall soccer, you're not playing any other sport or or, or, or basketball. And it doesn't matter. Uh, volleyball, travel volleyball is huge, and it's hurting some of the other sports. The numbers are down. So if if you're a good athlete, you need to be in the field competing. You need to be competing for your high school. And that other stuff will come down to only 2%. I don't know if the people are aware of this. Only 2% of all high school kids sign college scholarships. Only 2%. But everybody thinks that that's the, that's the holy grail. Get recognized, go to camps, get recognized, and do these things. But the best recruiting is going to be your high school coach. He's the guy that's going to sell you. He's the guy that has the contacts. He knows who the college coaches are. And, and on the other hand, some of these college coaches have, have, have to share some of this also because they're, they're, they're making it mandatory for kids to come to camps. And some of these camps are done during the other season uh, and, and during the, uh, the, the sports season of another, of a, of another school. And that, that's, not, that's not totally fair either. It's putting pressure on the kid. And the kid said, well, coach, I want to be recruited. Now, if a kid has an opportunity to choose between playing football or playing baseball, he's probably going to take baseball if he had to choose one because football is a little bit harder. It's a contact sport, and it, you have to have equipment. But one thing about football is say it's free. It's free. I mean, you can just play football with these travel schools. No, they're going to charge you $1,500, $2,000. And then plus the, the fact that everybody's got two bats, they got gloves and, and things of that nature. And mom and dad have to travel, stay in hotels and go to all these tournaments. So basically, as I said before, travel ball has a place in our society. Uh, you know, I like it. It's the competitive edge and kids want to play for championships. But on the flip side of it, make it a true travel ball team, not kids that can't play pitch and catch. And just, I, my dad makes a team just so I can play. You know, make it a competitive team. I've watched a lot of travel ball players in the past. I mean, I was when I became the baseball coach at St. Charles when I first got there, I had 40 players in my room. And I said, guys, how many of you guys that uh, travel ball, made travel ball? And all 40 raised their hand. And I said, guys, only nine of you can start. I just want you to know that. So the, the bottom line is that I, I just want a kid to enjoy his high school year. Uh, the, the, the four years, he's, five years he's going to spend in high school are special. And I, and I don't like to see a kid giving up something. And it's boys and girls. And it, it, it might be more prevalent in the girls with, because it's very, very intense to make a team. Well, if I play travel ball, I might be able to make this team. But yet what they're doing, they're putting all their eggs in one basket, so to speak, to say, hey, I can only play one sport. And, and, and that, that drives them away. And, you know, I, I think in participation, I don't like cutting athletes in, in any particular sport because I think if you have a high school, for instance, they have a right to go for that high school team, whether they're a starter or not. They have a right to be on whatever team that you might have. They have a right to be on that team. And that's the coach's discretion on who starts. That's the difference. Coach, I can't add as much value to the conversation as you can, but what I can tell you is that I played – recreational baseball for my entire childhood and I loved it it was you know some of the greatest memories of my life was playing with my friends and playing against guys who I eventually would go to high school with and we always still tell stories about you know back in the day we beat you and and so on and so forth and one thing I noticed is it was so competitive the the recreation ball was so competitive and you go these days and it's barren it's a wasteland and it's not It's not knocking anybody who's involved or playing it, but the problem is, as you mentioned, somewhere along the way, and it just so happened to be, I vividly remember this, playing only travel ball was unheard of when I was growing up. And there was a group of kids, you know, you play a certain age group um, every two years. And the guys who were going to come up and play with us that next year, a lot of them were like, well, we're not going to be playing with you next year. And to me, as a kid, I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, well, we're, we're just going to stick to travel ball. 
And at that time, I had never heard of such a thing, only playing travel sports. And from that point on, it be, it's become so much more relevant. You've got kids who are way overthrowing, um, especially pitching. Because, again, I look, I had my fair share of arm injuries. I blew up my elbow when I was younger, pitching too much, um, too, many, too many practice pitches. And, again, it, you know, it still hurts. I can't throw the ball nearly as much. That affects the way I'm going to be able to play ball with my son. And I didn't play travel ball. So for me, that's that's a problem. And coach, this is a story I didn't we didn't even talk about, but this is a true story. So I went to watch a cousin of mine play in another sport. I'm not going to even go into details, but there was a young boy who said, "Mom, the the team that we're playing next has a really good kid. He's ranked number ten in the state." And so what are you talking about? He said, "Yeah, this nine year." This nine-year-old that we're playing is ranked number 10 in the state. In what world are we living in where we are grading and rating travel players that are nine years old in the state? In what world does this make sense? And, of course, we had Jake DeLomar earlier talk about underdogs and things like that. But, I mean, you know, what does that have to – why are we ranking 10-year-old children? Coach, that makes no sense to me. Well, like I said before, when they get to high school, and there's going to be there going to be a lot of competition in high school from various areas, and there's nothing like you know nothing like playing for your high school, uh, you know the whole deal with the band and everything there. But what I'm seeing now is in the, in the lower extremity sports like soccer, for instance, and there's a lot of knock against well the the injury factor that is it is a factor in in, in football but it also there it's on if they're in every sport in basketball their knee injuries their ankle injuries that's, that's that's there i mean that's a story for another another podcast and we talk about the helmet helmet contact and, and that right. sort of thing but soccer's low extremity sports and when there's an injury in soccer it's normally a leg and um, and, and and you know nobody likes to have their legs injured and stuff like that but but in the wear and tear as you said but more importantly the financial aspect of what some of these parents are putting out i know a guy who paid five thousand dollars for his daughter to go play travel softball and, uh, and what, sometimes there's the burnout factor attached to that and uh, then you then you say well suppose she doesn't get a scholarship have i wasted all that money did she enjoy this 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 deal this is the thing jace they'll go all over the place say well i want my kids to travel and see places but when they get to high school their district that they're going to play in will be 20 right. miles away We'll be 20 miles away, so wait a minute now. What's wrong with playing this competition? You can find a lot of good competition 20 miles within your own district. So the, the bottom line, what I don't like to see is that kids, one, they're, they're deciding to play one sport. Now with this new rule by the LHSAA, now it has to be sanctioned by the, by the principal, and there's another little bylaw about only had four uh, from one particular team playing on the outside. But you can see fall baseball be a big thing. Uh, fall soccer leagues before that. You're going to see you're going to see basketball, which is already taking place. AAU is going to flourish over this. AAU is, and I'm not a proponent of uh, AAU because there's no rules and regulation. You can give kids gear. You can practice when you want to. There's no limitation on on games and stuff like that. And um, so, seven on seven travel football is getting bigger and bigger. And they're, they're, they're traveling all over the place, and they're promising kids scholarships, and they're promising exposure, meeting with different coaches, which is a bunch of malarkey because the, the best tape is the tape that the high school uh, coach can provide for you. So I'm totally, totally against it, and not as a whole. As a, again, let me qualify this by saying there's a place, but I think that please don't neglect your high school years and say I'm only going to play one sport. Because you, if you're a good athlete, that, you really help your school out if you can play more than one sport. I mean, as, as I said earlier, as, especially in some of the other sports that require skilled athletes. I mean, those basketball guys become great receivers and cornerbacks. Uh, baseball guys become become good quarterbacks. You look around um, a, a, a few years ago, I think Maneri had a baseball team where seven out of nine starters were also ex-football players. And a lot of the, the high school, I mean, a lot of the college baseball coaches love guys like that because they're mentally tougher. And I think that I think that matters. All right, Coach, we're going to go ahead and change gears off that topic, and we're going to look at the LSU quarterback battle, although we know head coach Brian Kelly has already come out and said, we have a starter, we've decided, but we're not going to come out and announce it because it gives us no tactical advantage, which I think is probably the smart play. But, Coach, what's your take on that situation? you got two very quality quarterbacks. I think we're both leaning the same way on where this is going to go. But let's hear your take on this situation and who you believe will be the starter come game one. Well, you know, Coach Kelly has a tough job. He's coming in. He, he has to re, 
uh, rebuild that entire roster. And, I mean, that's going to be really, really hard on him. But, you know, he's got a, you're in a great state, and I don't know if people realize this, the, the state of Louisiana is ranked fifth in the nation in Division One football players. Fifth in the nation. That says a lot. When you've got California and Texas, Texas – these the nation, California, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, Florida. That's pretty. That's pretty impressive. But I really think just the only experience I know. I saw them at the Manning camp. I saw the guys throw. Now they were just throwing the receivers versus air, and you can't tell an awful lot about that. You don't know anything about the the moxie. We talked to Jake Deloma. It actually brought up a couple of things that that you look for in the quarterback. But you know, if LSU's offensive line is not mature, not ready to play, they're probably going to have to go with a more mobile quarterback, and that leads more to the Daniels kid. Uh, nussmeyer has got you know he's got some experience. He's got a nice release, and the whole deal. Daniels is a, is a tall, wiry guy, and all depends on their offensive structure and i would i would listen i really think they'd probably both be in the ball game with, with a package and they say all right this package you're going to run this you can see more of this maybe the zone read stuff a lot like what joe brett uh, a bolo ran um and and the guy the, the walker kid's got a fine fine arm he's got a very very strong arm and then and as i saw in camp i just see miles brennan there he was there he spent the entire time with us so that's the only thing i can qualify but if i had to guess i think it would be daniels but i would not think that that, um, that it, it, Nussmeier would not be far behind and maybe even see them both in any one particular game. Yeah, I would expect both to at least get some action. Uh, Nussmeier will definitely hit the field, but my gut just tells me it's going to be Jane and Daniels day one. And, of course, I don't have the inside you know, scoop that you have. But from the outside looking in, um, I understand the discussions from fans. A lot of people were kind of hesitant on Jaden Daniels, and I can look at the numbers and tell you why again last season. 10 interceptions, 10 touchdowns, 50-50, losing a lot of possessions that way. However, one thing you have to pay attention to, he did throw for over 2,000 yards, which is a positive thing. But the main thing, which I think LSU fans can look at and say, this was an issue for the Tigers last year as well. This young man was sacked 26 times last year. It's hard to get into a rhythm when you're constantly on your back. Now, bear in mind that you know the level of competition he played throughout the year wasn't always great. He played a lot of teams that ranked 80s and 90s and 70s even in you know pass defense. But he had a few games against those bigger teams, and he struggled a bit. But again, when you're being sacked five times against Wisconsin, how are you supposed to be successful? So I think you also have to take into account who is Brian Kelly as a coach when it comes to quarterbacks. Well, you got to look at the list of names right here. So three of his past recent quarterbacks are Ian Book, Brandon Wimbush and Deshaun Kaiser, all guys who could scoot as well as throw the football. Well, the other, Jason, what you look for in the quarterback is those intangibles, so. Uh, yeah. You heard, heard Jake say that. Your release, does he have a quick release? Can he just slide in the pocket left or right? just for one step, two step, that's all. It's not an act, necessarily a scramble or an option or just a, an outright run. But, man, when, when a quarterback can extend plays, all of a sudden everybody's covered and he can extend plays, especially a lot of people play the, the man coverage. Uh, two man is the coverage that people play. And when you play two man, you better have a spy on the quarterback because he can hurt you with his legs. And I think that because of the RPO game, more and more people are playing that. So I, I would think that, that Daniels might be a starter. Again, uh, who, who I that have not watched practice. And I, listen, you got to understand that the Pac-12 is not a, sappy, a slappy league now. Right. It's pretty, you got some good football teams in there. And when you play that many games in that league, uh, it must mean something. Now, I'm not taking anything away from, from Nussmeyer because I think he's got, he's got a real nice release. Um, and, and the Howard kid, is, is I think he's got a bright future because he's got a strong, strong arm. Either way, we'll see that situation play out this Sunday as the Tigers will take on Florida State in the Superdome, and that should be an exciting matchup. And we're going to go ahead and move on to our next segment. Coaches always has his coach's cap on and breaks down the game from that standpoint. Let's jump into our Football 101 segment where Coach gives you the coaching perspective he carried throughout his Hall of Fame career. Coach, today our focus is your three keys to victory. So, Coach, can you break down what are those keys to victory and why are those things that you emphasize to your team on a daily basis? This is something that we, we posted on the board every year. Uh, Jason, and I, I really for you, special. It's like the three commandments uh, here. Number one, uh, these are, I think, keys to, to victory. One is turnover margin. And when you look back at the team that gave, they, if they turned over the ball X amount of time, you turned over margin at the end of the year, you've seen a successful team. You wanted to be plus. And I'll give you, for, for instance, uh, we won a state championship in, in, in a few years ago. 
the, that particular state championship team. Now, we had a quarterback by the name of Donnie Savard, was a little dart thrower, was very, very accurate, played for a couple of years, and he took care of the football, and he was the student of the game. But our uh, turnover margin was plus 23. That's unheard of. But, but that, that was the reason. Now, in other words, make a team beat your defense and not your offense. So don't turn over the ball, play field position. And I used to always tell them this, it's, it's okay to punt. That means on third down, just don't throw the ball up for, for grab. Just, you can punt the football, uh, get field position, you have a good defense, and all of a sudden I get better field position on the, on the next series. So turnover margin is very, very important as far as I'm concerned is the key to victory. And you look, you look back, and if you have a minus turnover margin, you probably didn't win that many games. Now, nowadays people are really working harder on, on what they call ball security which means they teach people to tuck the ball away. And, and also, but they also teach them the defense how to, how to strip. They teach them not only to strip, but to scoop and score. And, I mean, you see a lot of ball games and a lot of more controversial fumbles, and, and it, but you see a lot of scoops and scores, and all of a sudden that changes the momentum of the game. So you need to stay away from those big, big plays like that that change the momentum of the game. Uh, Bear Bryant used to always say, you know, a game is composed of three big momentum plays. The problem is you don't know when they're going to occur. So as a coach, you work your buns off like that next play could be that big momentum play. You know, so turnover margin is one of the, one of the keys. The second and, and, and big key is missed tackles. Now, you know, guys work really, really hard uh, on, on tackling, especially in open field. So your linebackers and, and, and your secondary, they must be, they must be uh, great tacklers. Because I mean, time, every time you see a great run by a back, you probably also saw two or three missed tackles. Now, you know, if you're an interior line, because the linemen don't have much sense. Once they, they have to button separate from the, 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 the blocker, but they don't, they're not going to give you a nice form tackle. They'll just try to you know, belly you down, body slam you or something like that, grab you by the, by the shoulder pads or, or ankle or whatever. But your linebackers and your secondary must be deadly tacklers. So missed tackles is a big part of it. And, and, and people work extremely hard on, on that. Also, I mean, um, the backs learn, they learn that how to do the back shoulder cut. They do a jump cut and stuff like that. And the receivers now, they've, they're so good after the catch. Lou Holtz had this thing. He said, you know, it's never the completion that hurts you. It's the catch after completion, what people call the yaks, yards after the catch. You know what I mean? So that's what's going to hurt you. So once we tell the guys that once you, if a, a offense does complete a pass, just make sure you gain tackle and get him on the ground and keep him right there. Don't let him extend that particular play. So missed tackles are a very, very big part of why teams lose. And you can tell that. It also goes back into the coaching aspect. Now, let me tell you the first thing about missed tackle, you got to have some athleticism. I mean, if you're not, if you're really stiff and, and you're not really athletic, you're going to have a problem tackling people anyway. You know, sometimes you can't tackle, couldn't tackle me in a phone booth. So what, what has to happen is that you work hard on that where people don't overrun it. But the next thing is uh, coaches work extremely hard on what they call gang tackling. We had a motto at, at, and we always said roll call around the ball. Now, what does that mean? That means when I turn off that film after a play, I want to see all 11 defenders in, in the film. You should be in the picture. If you're not, if you're not, that means we're not pursuing to the ball. So if one guy misses, maybe somebody else is there to pick up the slide. And third, and very, very important, is eliminate explosive plays if you're on defense, but make explosive plays if you're on offense. So in every ball game, we would say, all right, if the offense can make three explosive plays and the defense come up with three explosive plays, if you get six in the ball game, you have won that ball game convincingly. So as a defense, you don't want – what is an explosive play? Well, it could be a pass, and we gave it a limit. A pass over, over 30 yards was considered a completed pass. That's considered an explosive play. Or maybe you, you scooped and score. Or it might have been an explosive play. It might have been a big, long field goal. It might have been a kickoff return. It might have been maybe a big sack. So the coach will evaluate with exactly – this was the momentum changer. This changed the whole momentum of the game. But if you go back and look and say, as a, as a defender, you don't want any explosive plays. You want to keep the ball in front. You want to gain tackle. If you can eliminate from the defense explosive plays, you have a very good chance of winning the ball game, and it goes back to the field position. On, on the offensive side of the ball, if you had a big run, man, there's nothing like it. That's, that's the old expression I used to use all the time, you know, execution fuels emotion. Execution fuels emotion. So you execute something with a great pass, a great run, uh, it might be a big blitz, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden the whole sideline gets excited, and it motivates the entire football team. So, again, the, the three turnover margin, missed tackles, and explosive plays, and you win a lot of ball games.
coaching your championship teams that you won, how how often did you hit on all three of those you know, on a game on a game by game basis? Well, it, you know, we, we score that, and after every ball game, we graded we graded the film. And one thing the coaches always took pride in, and I'd ask the defensive coordinator at the time it was, it was lately it was Coach Stein. I said, Coach, how many missed tackles did we have total in the defense? And if if it was really double digits, that's a, that's a factor. And sometimes it was, sometimes it was. It depended on the back and the, the competition you, that you played. On the other side of the ball, you know, what was your turnover margin? How many times for the game our turnover margin was plus three? Well, by the end of the year, that, that, that starts to accumulate, and that was good. Um, I remember one year we weren't very good. We made it to the state championship. We weren't a great football team that year, a very young team, but we went eight consecutive games without a turnover. And, I mean, that's huge. And, I mean, a lot of that are the players themselves. It's a strength level holder, how to hold the ball, first of all. You give them a technique. And one thing we always taught uh, our players, we always taught our, our ball security to all the players, not just the backs and receivers and quarterbacks. Um, the quarterback is the most vulnerable, and he, he turns over the ball more than anybody else because his ball is exposed. He's either throwing the ball, he's hitting it off with a mesh or something like that. But we always taught the linebackers, the secondary, even D linemen, how to carry a football. And uh, we had a little thing at practice that really worked cool. If you were holding a football, you had to hold it correctly. And if you didn't, if you didn't, you put it on the ground. If another player knocked the ball out of your hand, then you had to do 25 up downs right there on the spot. So I remember. You, I'm familiar with saw, that. What you saw players doing, the players say, I'm not holding that ball. Somebody, so they put it down. So if you weren't going to hold it correctly, you got to make, you better make sure you ran away from the crowd. Right. I, I definitely remember that one being one of your rules. Not I was not going to touch the football if I didn't have to. I, I was a linebacker. I could barely hold on to it as it was. So, um, Coach, let's go ahead and transition to our next segment. Uh, where you guys get to ask Coach any hard-hitting questions you've been asking to get to him. So we're going to go ahead and ask questions for Coach. Uh, coach uh, had one question from Ball Coach Phil on Facebook, and he wanted to ask, what is the hardest route to coach and or teach on the route tree? Well, that's, a, that's a great question. Thank you for that question, Coach. I, I really appreciate that. Number one, I think the hardest route, you have two different, it's called the out route. Now, there's two different ways you run an out route. One is called a speed cut where you just turn off that inside foot, a three-step inside cut. It's a speed cut, and it's really, really good versus zone. But the route that I think is the hardest to teach, and it, it requires a lot, a lot of technique work, is the, the, the comeback route. I love the deep comeback route. You, of course, you need time to throw it. And uh, there's a certain time uh, the defender, whether it's man or zone, where that cornerback is going to flip his hips, and that takes place between 12 to 15 yards. When the cornerback flips his hips, then all of a sudden you want to learn to break and get out of that cut. Now, uh, there are drills that you do. One is a, is a line drill where you teach your player to take a big wide step and he makes a cut at a 90 degree. And there's another that's a real comeback, and he, he's coming back at a 45 degree angle. That's the one I like because the quarterback now will throw the ball forward and make, you, make the receiver go get it, even if he falls down. If it's a deep enough comeback, if he falls down, he's still going to have 16 yards. So that's important. Now, the overall route that I really like is just a pattern. A curl flat has survived the test of time. So just a curl and a flat with it. And, and it's, it's, you, see, uh, you see it every Saturday, every Sunday. You see it on Friday night. Curl flat is hard to take away. And if the receivers learn to, to run right. But to go back to hard, it's really difficult to, to get guys to do it right. And that's, that's the old comeback route. Now, again, it takes a lot of work. Um, you know, you don't want to expand your arm because when, when soon the DB, you can't give the body language to the DB that you're going to make a cut. It's so important that you surge, you keep your elbows closed. As soon as the arm fly away from your body, and you, you've already told that DB you're making a cut. Two, you don't get up on your toes before you make a cut. If you get up on your toes, we call it the ballerina. If you show them that, and it, 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 the, the defense all of a sudden, what that corner does, he closes the gap on you right now, and he breaks on it. And so your body language, and the quarterback looks like the guy that's, that's going to be, he's, he's going to be the culprit, and he threw an intercept, but you ran a bad route. You know, and, and especially nowadays, you have a lot of receivers cannot get off of press coverage. And if you can't get off the press coverage in college and pros, you can't, you're not going to play very long. But the, the corner, the comeback route is the hardest to teach because some guys just can't do it. Coach Monica has had over 50 years experience along the way, has gathered more experiences in the world of sports than most of us can dream of. So let's head to our next segment, Thanks for the Memories, where Coach is going to highlight some of his biggest and greatest moments along his journey. And, Coach, today we want to go ahead and highlight 
the 1977 Lutcher football team where you won a title. Coach, can you give us some background on it? What's the story, and, and what was that journey like? Well, number one, in 1976 at Lutcher, we had a bunch of guys that graduated. That was an awesome football team. They were undefeated, lost in the final, semifinals, but they were undefeated going to that time. We lost a lot of those players. The 1977 team was real, real young, green. Um, we had a young quarterback, a left-handed quarterback by the name of Carter Rara, we had, and another kid by the name of Didi Mathurin. They, they were splitting, splitting time. But it, the, the thing that made it unique, we're playing at Hornville, and it was a quagmire of a, of a, of a, a field. Um, it was still raining. Uh, we're, losing the, we're losing the ball game um, by, by, uh, by six points. No, I'm sorry, we lose losing by five points. And all of a sudden, with eight seconds left to go in the game, they had the football. And they decided to punt to us. And when they punted the ball, it, it, had it not been muddy, the ball would have rolled and time would have run out, we'd have lost the game. But all of a sudden, when he punted the ball, the ball was stuck in the mud. So with four seconds left, we took the quarterback. And our quarterback at this particular time, I'm sorry, let me go back and rephrase this. The quarterback was Ken Vickner. So Ken Vickner goes in the ball game, and, and it, I said, Ken, just put the ball up. Uh, to our receiver. And we had a receiver by the name of Leonard Clayton, and his nickname was Buckwheat. But Buckwheat could run. But on a wet field, uh, it, it, it was all negated. So anyway, Ken throws the ball up. He drops back, throws the ball as far as he can. But it was so slimy and wet, the ball didn't go very far. The two defenders for Hornville jump up for the ball to intercept it. If they bat the ball down, we lose. But the ball pops up in the air, and guess what? Buckwheat was behind him and ran for a 70-yard touchdown with four seconds left to go in the game, and we win the game. A little while later, uh, two weeks later, we're playing East St. John, at East St. John. Well, uh, Buckwheat was, was the running back, and he, he ran what we call a toss sweep. And it was called 29 toss sweep. But we didn't like to run it to the right. He only knew 29 toss sweep to run to the left. But what he did this particular night, we pitched the ball to him on our own 20-yard line, and all of a sudden the whole St. John team was over, so he backtracks, and he runs, he runs all the way back to the goal line, and he runs 80 yards for a touchdown. And it, but he had, he had tremendous speed. So once he got to the perimeter, I mean, it was, it, it was one of those things the coach said, no, 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 no. And all of a sudden, yes, yes, so he ran for an 80-yard touchdown. A little while later, we were playing St. James. And we're losing 20 to nothing at halftime. The field is, is, the field is real wet that night. Uh, half the Lutcher fans are already crossed the ferry. Back in those days, there was a ferry. that The bridge to nowhere was, was not there at the time. You know, and so we had to cross the ferry. Well, half the guys who had Bucks Bar, they're already in the second, the second uh, six-pack of beer over there. And uh, so all of a sudden, we come back, and it, the score is 26 to 14. And we had, we had the ball on, with two minutes left to go on our own eight-yard line. And I faked the punt because I said, we don't, we, 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 we used to, we're not going to win the game unless we do something. We faked the punt. It did not work. So th they scored on the very next play. So they scored. So they're, up, they're up by two touchdowns. And the, now the time running, running down to a minute and 50 left to go in the ball game. We take the ball, and with three passes, we score. So we're down by a touchdown. Now, so the, the, score, the score now is, is um, 26 to – yeah, 20, yeah, 26 to 21, okay? So all of a sudden, we onside kick with eight seconds left. We get the football, one second, one sec, two seconds left on the clock. Ken Vickner again, and my man again, Buck Wheat, runs what we call a post corner, or what people now call a flag route, and Ken throws the ball up. I don't know how he did it, but he outran everybody. He catches the ball. We run in. We win the ball game 27-26. And the people at Buck Bar did not believe it. They already, they already were stoned by the time we got there and said, you're all smoking wacky weed. We didn't win that ball game. <laughs> but anyway, that, that was, we called that team the cardiac, the cardiac kids that year. And, I mean, it was just, it was, it, they ended up losing in the semifinals. And, but it was, a, it was a great tribute to that 1977 team. Said a lot of a lot of memories from some of those seasons that you've had, but coach, uh, let's go ahead and close out the show with one last segment. Of course, you guys know coaches put it all on the line, laid it out there week by week. But let's see where he's laying his money this week in our lock of the week. Coach, where are you laying your money? Uh, well, I, I think I think what I'm going to do, and I'm basing this on sentiment. And one of the worst things you can do as a, as a gambler is bet sentiment. But I will do it, and this is Devin Leary, North Carolina State, and minus 11 against East Carolina. And, uh, you know, I looked at Ohio State hard, and, uh, but they're playing a good football team, but I think they're, they're giving, giving up a lot of points. But I think, I think North Carolina State is my lock of the week. 
All right, and that'll wrap things up here for us. Uh, before we head out, we want to go ahead and make sure that you guys are aware of all the social media that you can follow us on. Again, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, all at the LBF Podcast. Or you can join our Facebook group at the Let's Be Frank Video Podcast. And, of course, you can catch us on YouTube, on VSN, every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And anywhere that you can listen to podcasts as well. So, Coach, uh, first show. What are your What are your thoughts? How do you feel getting your, your feet wet with our first full show? Well, I feel I feel good. I think that was pretty cool. You know, what I mean, that's, that's real cool. I mean, the fact that we can pull this off uh, with Justin be way up there in Utah, and I think Justin's hour is he hour Justin Justin's a ways away, and plus he was dealing with me all last night and all today, trying to get everything last minute set up. So. Uh, a shout out to Justin, who's not not on camera with us, but pulling all the right. all the wires behind because I, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, oh, good. So again, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Again, we will be back next week, and of course, next week we'll have the opportunity to be talking about some real action and not hypothetical action. Week one of high school and college football will be underway, so we'll get to dive into some of those matchups that we got to watch, some of the games that we enjoyed, and of course, maybe preview some of the future games. And, of course, as we said, every Wednesday, 7 o'clock, VSN, YouTube, follow us on social media, and that'll do it for tonight. So um, that wraps things up here from us, from the send, Let's Be Frank podcast. We had something, Coach? Send, yeah, just send those questions in. Like please do. Because yes, please send those questions in. Uh, again, we, we only had one this week. Again, if we have more in the future, we'll make sure to add those to that slot. So, again, we want to thank everybody for tuning in to the debut episode of the Let's Be Frank podcast. So, for Coach Frank Monica, I am Jason Duey. And remember, let's lay bon ton, let the good times roll. God bless everybody. Bye.